how does studying memory affect your understanding of the nature of time? So like we've been talking about us living in the, the present and making decisions about the future, standing on the foundation of these memories and narratives about the memories that we've constructed. So it feels like it does weird things to time. Yeah, and the reason is, is that in some sense, I think, especially the farther we go back, I mean, there's all sorts of interesting things that happen. So your sense of like, if I ask you, how different does one hour ago feel from two hours ago? You'd probably say pretty different. But if I ask you, okay, go back one year ago versus one year and one hour ago, it's the same difference in time. It won't feel very different, right? So there's this kind of compression that happens as you look back farther in time. So that it's kind of like why when you're older, the difference between somebody who's like 50 and you know, 45 doesn't seem as big as the difference between like 10 and five or something, right? When you're 10 years old, everything seems like it's a long period of time. Here's the point is that, you know, so one of the interesting things that I found when I was working on the book actually was during the pandemic, I just decided to ask people in my class when we were doing the remote instruction. So one of the things I did was I would poll people. And so I just asked people, do you feel like the days are moving by slower or faster or about the same? Almost everyone in the class said that the days were moving by slower. Mm -hmm. um, so then at the, I would say, okay, so do you feel like the weeks are passing by slower, faster, or the same? And the majority of them said that the weeks were passing by faster. So according to the laws of physics, I don't think that makes any sense, right? Yeah. But according to memory, it did, because what happened was people were doing the same thing over and over in the same context. And without that change in context, their feeling was that they were in one long, monotonous event. And so, but then at the end of the week, you look back at that week and you say, well, what happened? I have no memories of what happened. So it must, the week just went by without even my noticing it. But that week went by during the same amount of time as an eventful week where you might've been going out and hanging out with friends on vacation or whatever, right? It's just that no, nothing happened because you're doing the same thing over and over. So I feel like memory really shapes our sense of time, but it does so in part because context is so important for memory. Well, that compression you mentioned, it's an interesting process. Because when I think about when I was like 12 or 15, I just fundamentally feel like the same person. It's interesting what that compression does. It makes me feel like it's all, we're all connected, not just amongst humans and spatially, but in terms, in back in time, there's a kind of uh, eternal nature, like the timelessness, I guess, mm -hmm. to life. That could be also a genetic thing just for, for me. I don't know if, everyone agrees to this view of time. But to me, it all feels the same. Like you don't feel the passage of time or? No, I feel the passage of time in the same way that your students did from day to day. Mm -hmm. There's certain markers uh, that let you know that time has passed, you celebrate birthdays and so on. But the core of who I am and who others I know are oh. or events, it like that compression of my understanding of the world. Okay removes time because time is not useful for the compression. So like the details of that time, at least for me, is not useful mm -hmm. to understanding the core of the thing. So maybe what it is, is that you really like to see connections between things. This is like really what motivates me in science mm -hmm. actually too. But it's like when you start recalling the past to, you know, and seeing the connections between the past and present, now you have this kind of web of interconnected memories, right? Mm -hmm. And so I can imagine in that sense, there is this kind of the present is with you, right? Um, but what's interesting about what you said too that struck me is that your 16 year old self was probably very complex, you know? And I, I'm, by the way, I'm the same way, but it's like, it really is the source of a lot of <laughs> darkness for me, so, but, uh, <laughs> But when, like, you can look back at, like, let's say you hear a song that you used to play, like, mm -hmm. before you would go do a sports thing or something mm -hmm. like that. And you might not think of yourself as an athlete, but once you, you get back to that mental, you mentally time travel to that particular thing, 
you open up this little compartment of yourself that wasn't there before, right? That didn't seem accessible before. Dan Schachter's lab did this really cool study where they would ask people to either remember doing something altruistic or imagine doing something altruistic. Mm -hmm. And that act made them more likely to want to do things for other people. Mm -hmm. So that act of mental time travel can change who you are in the present. And we tend to think of, this goes back to that illusion of stability. And we tend to think of memory in this very deterministic way that I am who I am because I have this past. But we have a very multifaceted past and can access different parts of it and change in the moment based on whatever part we want to reach for, right? How does nostalgia connect into this? Like this desire and pleasure associated with going back. Yeah, so um, my friend Felipe de Brigard uh, wrote this and it just like blew my mind where the word nostalgia was coined by a Swiss physician who was actually studying traumatized soldiers. And so he described nostalgia as a disease. And the idea was it was bringing these people extraordinary unhappiness because they're remembering how things used to be. Um, and I think it's it's very complex. So as people get older, for instance, nostalgia can be an enormous source of happiness, right? Um, and being nostalgic can improve people's moods in the moment. But it just depends on what they do with it. Because what you can sometimes see is nostalgia has the opposite effect of thinking those were the good old days and those days are over, right? It's like, America used to be so great and now it sucks. <laughs> or, you know, my life used to be so great when I was a kid and now it's not, right? And you're selectively remembering the things that, I mean, we don't realize how selective our remembering self is. And so, you know, I lived through the 70s. It sucked. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, partly it sucked more for me, but <laughs> I would say that even otherwise, it's like there's all sorts of problems going on. Gas lines, people were like, you know, worried about like Russia, nuclear war, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, it's just this idea that people have about the past can be very useful if it brings you happiness in the present, but if it narrows your worldview in the present, you're not aware of those biases that you have, you will end up, you can end up, it can be toxic, right? Either at a personal level or at a collective level.